So we just had a landmark dividend investing meetup in Los Angeles. I am going to recap this meetup today. I am going to answer some questions that came out of this meetup. Honestly, this meetup was so awesome. There were nine attendees, including myself, so we had a really, really special turnout. It was in Sherman Oaks in the Valley at the Galleria Mall, of course, at Starbucks. Where else? And honestly, I have enough value in today's video to honestly probably fill two or three videos. But there ain't no half stepping around here like Big Daddy Kane. I want to just get it out there, get it in your hands. I'm going to do one video. I'm going to go as quickly as possible. And I want to go over a um, hypothetical scenario about driving $25,000 a year in cash flow after just 15 years of investing. My man Richard was asking, is this possible? Will I have a mathematical model that I'm going to share with you all today to answer Richard's question? I also want to go through a ton of stocks that we covered in the meetup and what I think about those stocks. These are favorites of the community, of the community members at the meetup. Also, a stock that came up at the meetup was Texas Instruments. This is a dividend stock that members of our community really like. And I want to review that stock today. I want to go through a stock analysis, a quick one of Texas Instruments. Also, I have a bunch of other ground to cover. I want to go through a bunch of insights from our meetup spanning generational stuff, fourth turning type stuff, spanning real estate investment and property management, spanning some of our favorite books. There is just so much to cover. Get ready. This is going to be an amazing dividend investing video. So I want to start with the really, really good stuff. I want to share with you my response, my mathematical model that really went into the question that I received at the meetup. The question goes like this. Hey, Ian, I want to kind of semi-retire or fully retire in about 15 years time. Not too long from now. I'm willing to commit $8,000 a year to investments, towards investments maybe as high as $10,000 a year. And I want to understand after 15 years time, is it possible to cash flow in dividends 25,000 a year? 25,000 that could be used to pay bills. And so my gut told me that this would be possible, but that it would also be very aggressive. Someone in this particular situation is looking at a very particular type of stock to reach those types of goals. And so I ran some hypothetical scenarios. I'm going to share on the screen with all of you the um, the math that I did at home. And I basically modeled this after the stock of AbbVie. AbbVie is a really unique stock because the current dividend is really high and the dividend growth rate, the compound annual growth rate is really high as well. There's another stock, um, Altria, which shares similar characteristics. It has a high current year yield, but also a high growth rate. Not many stocks fall into this bucket because typically you have stocks that have a high dividend yield, but lower growth rate, or you have stocks with a lower dividend yield, but a really high growth rate. And I mix and match all of the, the above. But in very, very rare instances, you get the best of both worlds. I see that right now with Abvi. I see it right now with Altria. You get the best of both worlds. You get a high current yield, a starting yield, but a high growth rate as well. And so I'm thinking, the gears are turning. I'm thinking this scenario, how could I possibly make this happen? 25,000 cash flowing per year after 15 years with investing 8,000 a year. I knew off the bat, I would have to choose a stock like AbbVie. And so I model this scenario after AbbVie. And so I want to start on the screen here with my analysis. This is a multi-part analysis. So get ready. This is really, really going to be exciting. And I will link to this in the description below as well if you want to follow along at home. Okay. So what I do here is I have a table and I just want to understand yield on cost. I want to understand what will yield on cost be 
after 15 years time if I were to buy AbV today and if these assumptions hold up and the assumptions that I have are I'm able to buy it at the current share price of $89.33 that um, they're going to continue to grow the dividend and they're going to grow that pretty aggressively. They're going to grow at 11% per year. Mind you, the compound annual growth rate for the last five years has actually been 21%. But for this model, I'm assuming 11% because I don't know if the 21% can hold up forever. Although I think that 21%, uh, it'll be somewhere between 11 and 21, quite frankly, because the payout ratio right now is only 48% and this company is growing. Anyways, that's assumption one. Assumption two is that the, the stock price, the capital appreciation will be about 7% per year. And so that it'll grow 7% per year over time. All right. So what I do is I say, hey, in year one, I just buy one share. The current share price is $89.33. And I know what the dividend is. It's $4.28. So I receive $4.28 of dividend income in year one for the one share I purchased. My yield on cost is 4.79%. Obviously not very exciting. But what happens in year two? Okay, well, in year two, I have more shares. Why is that? Well, I buy actually a fractional share with the dividend income I received in year one. I reinvest that money that I received in the dividend. I'm not using it to pay bills yet. I reinvest to buy more shares of AbbVie. So year two, I'm rolling with 1.05 shares. And the share price is a bit higher. It's at 95.58. And um, the dividends per year now are higher because I have 1.05 shares multiplied by the um, dividend rate. And um, mind you, this dividend has been increased uh, uh, by 11%. And so my dividend income is now $4.98. It's higher than the first year. And my yield on cost is 5.57%. This is not just a simple yield on cost. It's an all-in yield on cost because I'm reinvesting dividends. And so that's how this model works. It just keeps doing that line after line after line. Year three, I have 1.1 shares. Now, mind you, I'm acquiring these shares at the higher price. I'm acquiring my year three shares that are higher. I acquired them at the year two price, the new shares at $95. I didn't acquire them at 89. I acquired them at 95. And that's why I have the capital appreciation baked in here because we know realistically the way dividend reinvestment works. Hopefully AbbVie continues to be weak, but most likely it'll step up in price over time. And so so on and so forth, this first model shows what would happen just with one share. I'm just starting easy. One share of AbbVie, what will happen after about 15 years? Well, that one share will turn into 2.3 shares because I'm reinvesting my dividends and my yield on cost will actually become 47.59%. And so that's what you see all the way at the bottom of this chart in the bottom right. It literally takes what I just did on the first two lines, keeps doing it, uh, for 15 years. After 15 years, the one share becomes 2.3 and I've got a massive yield on cost. This is the magic of dividend investing, by the way. This is why I do it. This is why stocks like AbbVie, quite frankly, are magical because they have the best of both worlds. You can get to a really high yield on cost quickly as long as some of the risk factors like their massive debt, their the unknowns around Allergan acquisition, unknowns around Humira patent expiration in the United States. Hopefully Skyrosy picks up a bunch of those sales, if not more than compensates for it, but there's risks. But assuming those risks are dealt with and the company thrives, this is what could happen after 15 years. So this doesn't answer anyone's question yet, but this is the backbone. This is the backstory that must be looked at first to understand how, how is it possible? Could it be possible to cash flow 25K? So let's move on. I'm going to show another uh, chart on the screen here. And what you see here now is a time-based analysis of how much money is being invested. So I have years one through 15. Across all those years, I'm hypothetically investing $8,000. The question was eight to 10,000. I just went with the lower case. I went with 8,000. And what happens here is in year one, I'm assuming, by the way, I deploy this money basically the first day of each year. And so year one, I deploy the 8,000. How many years is that money deployed? It's deployed for 15 years. That money gets the best yield because it has the most time in the market, best yield on cost. 
Year two, the money is only deployed 14 years. Year three, only 13 years. So you see, as the years go on, as I deploy more money, hypothetically, there's less time. There's less years deployed, less time for that money, because we know in this hypothetical scenario, we're talking about stopping. Year 15, hey, using the cash flow to pay for bills. Okay, so here's where it gets really interesting. What I do, and you'll see this if you download the spreadsheet, is I've got yield on cost. How do I get yield on cost? Well, what I do is for year one money, which is deployed in the market for 15 years, I take my 47.59% from the chart that we just saw and I multiply it by $8,000. That gets me $3,807.59 in year in, um, for year one money. Year two money, after it's only going to be invested for 14 years, because I'm deploying it again the first of the year, hypothetically, it's only going to be deployed for 14 years. My yield on cost isn't as good. If I go to the prior chart, it's um, row 14. It's the 14th year. What's that yield on cost for 14-year money? Well, it's 39.81%. If I take 39.81, I multiply by 8,000, I get $3,184.40. And so what you see here in this chart is for each tranche of money that I deploy over the years, my yield on cost that I get on that money goes lower and lower and lower and lower. And this is the time factor. This is because time is passing and um, my deadline is getting closer and there's just less years for that money to work. Important, important assumption here. I'm assuming for this model that in general, over my 15 years of investing, I can find a stock each year that is kind of like an ab abvi. It has a great starting yield and it's undervalued and it has a high dividend growth rate. That's a big assumption here. I use AbbVie, by the way, to kind of model this whole thing. But what I'm saying for this portfolio, it doesn't have to be all AbbVie. It could be a combination of stocks like AbbVie that are bought in the moment with each $8,000 tranche over the years to have AbbVie-like performance. And so that's a key assumption is that I could find stocks over the next 15 years yearly that would have AbbVie-like performance. And so anyways... I get to the bottom of my table here. I sum it all up. I'm at $22,000, 360, 22,364.43. So I'm almost at the $25,000 that um, we were looking for in this scenario. So pretty darn close. However, this is with the $8,000. If I just go really quickly and instead of investing $8,000 a year, I'm just going to do this in real time. I have the Excel right in front of me. I'm going to turn all those 8,000s into 10,000s. What does that do? That if I So instead of investing 8,000 a year, I hypothetically invest 10,000 a year. My yield on cost after 15 years of doing this is $27,955.53. So the question was, Ian, if I invest between $8,000 and $10,000 a year for 15 years, can I cash flow $25,000 at the end of it all and use that money to pay bills? My answer is yes, because uh, $8,000, you're kind of slightly below the goal, $10,000 slightly above. And so realistically, if um, the amount deployed is kind of between eight dollars to $10,000 a year, some years it might be eight, some might be ten. Uh, it, it looks to me, especially with the assumption that some conscious risk is taken on. Stocks like AbbVie are available for the picking. Stocks that have the high dividend growth rate, the value, and the amazing starting yield. If all of that plays out, in my opinion, it is possible. Now, is this a bit of a stretch case? Yes, I'm stretching for it, I'm reaching for it, but it's possible. And quite frankly, this is what I did when I started my portfolio. I had 100% of my money in SIN stocks. This is why I am where I am today, because I, I did this actually, this kind of scenario in reality. I went all in on that the stocks, the SIN stocks that had this exact profile. High starting yield, high dividend growth rate, best of both worlds. That best of both worlds scenario is clutch. It is really important, in my opinion, for investors who are kind of in this situation where there's a cash flow goal, time is short, and um, there's a need to get to that goal. And so I thought this was a really good question. I hope my answer makes sense. 
If it does not, make sure to check out the description below because I will link to this spreadsheet, which will be very helpful to look around and peruse the spreadsheet to, um, to see all those numbers pan out. And again, keep in mind that the reason the yield on cost goes down for each tranche deployed is each tranche has less time to, um, to, to grow. It has less time to compound. This is another reason why with dividend investing, it's so important to start early. Worth noting, even at year 15 and 16, let's say this hypothetical person now starts spending this money on bills. As long as the investor doesn't cut into principal, the cash flow will continue to grow because the dividends will get increased over time. AbbVie is not going to stop raising their dividend in year 15. It's going to keep on going. And so, yeah, in year 16, 17, 18, hypothetically, I'm not reinvesting dividends anymore here, so it won't snowball as much, but my yield on cost will still go up. Cash flow will still go up because I'm receiving continual dividend increases. Again, this is the magic of dividend investing. This is why we all do it. And um, so fabulous question, my friend. Um, this was a question hypothetical from Richard. Obviously, I need to remind the entire community here that this is hypothetical. I'm just speaking to my personal situation, hypothetically, just sharing my personal journey. Um, there's no investment advice offered on um, this channel, just sharing my personal journey for fun and entertainment. But I thought this was a really fun hypothetical case because People wonder sometimes, um, is it possible? And I encourage you to take the model home, put in your own assumptions. This is probably pretty aggressive. And so look at some more conservative assumptions and see what it does for you. Even with a more conservative dividend growth rate, even with a more conservative starting dividend yield, good things are possible. You compensate for it with more time in the market and with more money deployed. Okay. So I have a lot of ground to cover today. I want to move on to the next one. I want to talk about Texas Instruments. This is a stock that came up in the meetup. I've been asked a lot of questions about TI over the years. People ask me, Ian, can you do a TI analysis? Uh, what do you think about Texas Instruments? Let's do it. Let's just do this. And so I'm going to pop some stats on the screen. And um, this is a company currently trading at a premium. It is trading at $126.35. The analyst estimates are 513 for 2019. They're 501 for 2020. Actually goes down. PE is in that 24-25 range. Starting dividend yield is 2.8%. Payout ratio is 70%, which is really high. Five-year dividend compound annual growth rate is 21%. So there's a few high-level things here that pop to my mind. When I before I even get into the next part of this analysis, PE looks awfully high, especially when the 2020 earnings are expected to be lower than 2019. So that's something that comes to mind. The other thing is has growth slowed? It just shows me if the analysts think it's going to earn less in the next year, is growth slowing or is it just really cyclical? Next thing, payout ratio is really high. I don't necessarily mind a high payout ratio, but at a tech company, boy, I sure do, because are they going to be investing enough money back into the company to continually innovate, or are they paying out too much of the money to shareholders? Seems like that payout ratio is awfully high. And so my understanding of Texas Instruments is they're mainly in the analog semiconductor space. They're, they're, they have a big percentage. I think they're the leader in that market. It's a big fragmented market, so there's still a lot of room for them to grow. But within the market of all the players, my understanding is they're the number one or they're the leader, if you will, of analog semiconductors. And their um, semiconductors are used across many different industries, so they have a very diversified approach. Now, I am no semiconductor expert, and one of the things I love so much about this community is I continually learn things from this community. For example, I've learned a whole lot about AbbVie and Humira um, from many different pharmacists and community members who some of them use this drug, some of them uh, understand this because they're pharmacists or medical doctors. So please, please, um, now I want to flip from pharmaceuticals over to semiconductors. If you have information on Texas Instruments, where it kind of stands in the semiconductor space, 
what um, what makes them cool and unique, what makes them bad and um, not not good. Share it all. This is what's so helpful about this community because we're dividend investors helping other dividend investors. We're dividend investors coming together really strong. And so share what you know about TI. I'd love to learn more. The most, I, I don't know much about semiconductors at all. So just uh, based on what I read, I kind of understand that they have this niche in the analog space, but I'd love to learn more. So I want to pop on screen some selected financial data that I think is going to explain to all of you why the PE is so darn high at this company, because their, their numbers are awesome. And so check this out. Uh, one of the first things you see is they highlight cash flows from operating activities. If you look at the cash flow in 2014, it's at four, um, uh, four billion. And if you look at it in uh, 2018, it's up at seven billion. And so basically they have grown their cash flows by 77% in a four year period. If you compare 2018 versus 14. And so that is um, just staggering. Free cash flow what goes from 3.669 billion up to 6.058 billion, up 65%. That is Thug Life, uh, Texas Instruments. You guys are doing something really, really well. And you can see down here, Analog makes up the lion's share of their um, revenue. Uh, uh, boy, uh, 10.8 billion of the revenue uh, of the 15.7 comes from Analog. And so that makes, all, in 2018 at least, this is from their annual report, they are heavy in that space. Um, if you just look at this company, quite frankly, margins are really good here. And so I don't even, um, I haven't even calculated it yet. Let me do that really quickly. How do you calculate net margin? So I'm just going to take the net income of 5580 and I want to divide by the revenue. This is from 2018 of 15784. Wow. Net margins, 35%. Again, thug life, very, very stellar margins. And by the way, their net income is up 98% over this period. If I compare that 5580 versus the 2821 from 2014. Obviously, a lot to like in their selected financial data. I didn't even go down into their income statement or balance sheet yet. This is literally just my quick look at their annual report, selected financial info. And so I thought that was really helpful. Now, however, what I also want to point out is they highlight more selected financial info and they do it in the form of the balance sheet. I want to pop that on the screen because these guys have next to no debt. So if you look at their cash in 2018, 4.2 billion. If you look at their long-term debt, 4.3 billion. Cash basically cancels out long-term debt. This is a company has positioned itself really well with um, a stellar balance sheet. So when I look this is all I'm going to do, by the way, right now for Texas Instruments, because I got to go quick. I got a lot to cover. Here's what I think about Texas Instruments. Revenue growth historically has been fabulous. Earnings growth, cash flow growth, margins are good. Balance sheet is stellar. Analysts forecast a slowdown in earnings growth. I want to know more about that. If you're in this stock, if you know about this sector, please, please share that with the community. That would be incredibly helpful. Um, and my understanding is they're really heavy in analog chips. I want to learn more about that. I just don't know enough. And so for me, I understand uh, the companies I invest in, like even AbbVie. I understand what they're doing um, on semiconductors. I, I'll get there. I mean, I'll get there over time. It's not as much of a passion of mine as the pharma space. And so maybe it'll take longer. This is a tangent, by the way, that I want to bring up investing, dividend investing. It has been a gateway for me to knowledge. It has been a gateway for me to learn all about all kinds of um, pharmaceuticals. And one of my personal goals as an investor in 2020 is to take a deep dive into the pharma space, really understand the pipelines of all the major players so that I can be a better investor. Take this home. If you're an investor and you're kind of trying to make sense of everything, one of the coolest things of all this, putting the 
gains aside, the yield on cost, the massive cash flow, all that aside, living off of dividends. It's the knowledge. It's actually using investing to be a more informed person, to be a more knowledgeable person, to be a more educated person. That's why I love about this and this community, quite frankly, is I know nothing about analog devices. I'm going to learn more because I know folks from the community are going to chime in in the comments below, and I'm just going to keep researching. And in 2020, on the pharma side, I'm going to learn a whole bunch about um, pharma as well. So I'm really, really excited about that. On that note, quite frankly, I'm skipping around, but I got a lot to cover today. Um, I want to talk about Pfizer. I want to talk about Pfizer. This is a stock that I own. This is a stock that I love. I take pride investing in big pharma because big pharma, in my opinion, is doing good for society. It's, they are improving the overall health of society by doing cutting edge research and developing cutting edge um, drugs and medical devices and solutions. And so Pfizer, I'm going to bring this up on the screen right now. What's going on with Pfizer? The reason I'm bringing it up is they just raised the dividend. An example in real time, this is a company I own, just raised the dividend by 5.6%, and it's trading at $38 per share. Um, analysts are estimating 2.95 EPS in 2019, slowing, by the way, kind of like Texas Instruments 2020, coming in at 289. The PE is basically in that 13 range. Maybe, quite frankly, the reason esti analysts estimate the EPS slowing in 2020 is because they're spinning off um, Upjohn, merging it with this company Mylon. It's going to be a non-taxable reverse Morris trust transaction. Uh, my understanding is Pfizer shareholders like myself are now going to own shares in Pfizer and the combined entity. So quite frankly, maybe the reason earnings are slowing with analysts for Pfizer is just that is Upjohn is no longer going to be part of Pfizer. Maybe there's something like that with Texas Instruments. Please chime in if you know about it. Maybe they're doing something wacky like that as well. Love to learn more. If you're a Texas Instruments expert, I'd love to learn more about the company. Anyways, going back to Pfizer, PE in the 13s, dividend is a 3.9% yield, payout ratio 52%, huge compound annual growth rate 7.89%. The reason I'm on Pfizer right now, quite frankly, I'm kind of thinking about Pfizer. I'll probably add some more. So I just did a video, I'll link in the description below about the high yielding stocks I am looking to buy, to add to in 2020. I didn't include Pfizer because it didn't meet the cut. It was at 3.9% dividend yield starting, but the stocks in that analysis were at a four and higher. Pfizer's kind of close enough that I probably should have included it. And so the reason I'm talking about this now is I'm kind of amending my last video I want to include Pfizer on the list. Pfizer is a company that is close enough to that 4% cutoff. And the reason I like it is they just increased the dividend by 5.6%. The PE is in that 13 range, which is really good. Pharma right now, it's on sale. Pharma right now is a good value. And so I love buying Pharma here. I don't love Pfizer as much as AbbVie, but um, I, I really got love for it. And... Um, I'm probably, maybe I'm mispronouncing this or not, but they just got approval on a drug called Extandi. This is a drug, by the way, for prostate cancer that is already being used on about 400,000 or so patients, but they just got approval to use it on a specific subset of patients that have a form of prostate cancer that actually spreads to the body. This is a um, segment of about 40,000 people in the United States, I believe, who now could benefit from this drug Extandi. And so this is what I'm saying. Big picture going beyond the money. I have a passion for learning and you kind of, you get older, late thirties, two kids, and you, you get into a job, you get into a routine, you start just thinking about life and you start thinking what's next. And you start what I've basically learned is if you ever stop challenging yourself, if you ever stop growing, life becomes really boring. And so I'm thinking, how can I challenge myself? What's next? And what's next for me, I know nothing about the medical industry. I worked in the health insurance industry for a long time, so I know a lot about that side, but I'm talking about drug pipelines and stuff. I'm no expert on that. Why not? Why not sit down in 2020, read some medical journals, read um, the literature published by these big pharma companies, talk to others in the community 
who know about this stuff. This is what it's all about. For me, this is what makes the investing even more fun than the money. Well, I guess nothing <laughs> kind of surpasses those dividend checks, but this knowledge, it's right up there with it. And so that's just, just a takeaway that kind of dawned on me the other day is this is what makes life fun, this stuff. And so I love it. I love Pfizer adding it to my 2020 list. I'm going to buy some more Pfizer. I just like it here. I feel good. Everyone was celebrating the dividend increase. I'm celebrating this fact that Xtandi was um, approved for these uh, this segment of, um, of uh, people unfortunately faced with prostate cancer. Yeah, dividend is cool, but quite frankly, when you are improving lives um, and you're able to support that through your investing, that is so cool. And so that just, uh, I'm kind of thinking about that in a new way that I might just go a little bigger in my portfolio, even than I have on these medical companies because I, I've got a lot of love for what they're doing. Okay, so next segment of today's video, I'm gonna transition now and talk about the stocks at the meetup that we covered because I asked a question at the meetup. Hey everyone, what are some of the stocks that you like? What are your favorite stocks? What are you looking at for 2020? And it ran such a huge range. Not all of these are 2020. They're um, you know, a variety of um, stocks that folks in the group own. But I just want to uh, cover these because there's some really good picks in there. And I'll tell you, by doing this meetup, it got me focused. It got me focused on some stocks that had slipped my mind. And so I want to talk about that. Check out the screen. So we got Texas Instruments first. I just highlight stuff in red that is really glaringly bad to me and stuff in green that is really glaringly good to me. TI, hey, some of the, the good stuff isn't really represented on this screen, like all those good financials, but uh, I did put a green for that compound annual growth rate on the dividend. Really sweet, even higher than Starbucks. But that payout ratio is awfully high. Ford PE, awfully high. Next one that came up was Starbucks. We had our meetup at Starbucks. I just can't say enough good stuff about Starbucks. I, I've talked about it at length on, our ch on, on the channel in the community. Uh, so I'm not going to harp on it today, but the PE for Starbucks right now is really high. Uh, compound annual growth rate, though, on that dividend is really high as well, and payout ratio is low. Starbucks, the reason it came up is one of the younger investors in our uh, on our group, one of the younger investors in the community was saying that this is a stock that he is looking at for 2020. It makes total sense. As a younger investor, it oftentimes works. It oftentimes works to pay for a little like more expensive stock that is growing quickly. And that's just what Starbucks is. And so for me, I won't be doing it this year unless it tanks, but it makes sense to me why certain people, everyone's situation is different, would be interested in Starbucks right here. And I love it. It's one of the favorite stocks in my portfolio. Cedar Fair came up as well. It's funny. One of the community members said that he lives very close to Knott's Berry Farm. This is a theme park in Southern California, and he was saying maybe we even do a meetup at Knott's Berry Farm uh, sometime. That would be awesome. And so um, Cedar Fair, honestly, a lot of these metrics, I shouldn't have even listed them because as an MLP, uh, EPS doesn't even make sense. PE doesn't even make sense. But what I like about Cedar Fair is the fast, the, the, the uh, sorry, the high dividend yield. What I don't like is the slow dividend growth rate. It's the opposite of fast. It's growing it slow. And they're digesting a lot of acquisitions, and so it's going even slower. I also talked in my last video how they're not covering the distributions right now with cash flow, and so I got to keep that a real close eye on that. I think it'll come back, but there's a lot to watch with Cedar Fair right now, but I'll probably buy some next year. It's a high yielder, and I need cash flow. Intel came up. We were talking about Texas Instruments, and so someone else brought up Intel. Intel is one of these stocks, and this is why investing is hard. I've perpetually heard uh, for like probably the last five or 10 years bad stuff about them. The PC is going away. Intel's processors are mainly for PCs. They're not very strong in the mobile space. They're not really strong in the internet of things, this and that. I don't know if what I'm saying here is even true. I'm repeating things that I heard, and I hear these things and I've always shied away from Intel, but check this out. It's got a uh, 12, PE of 12, really low payout ratio, 27%, and they're growing the dividend by 7% for the last five years on average. I think that Intel is honestly playing this a little better than TI. TI, your payout ratio is too high. Intel, just right. But please chime in. This is why I love this community. If you are an expert in semiconductors or if you work in that industry, you know something about that industry, 
I'd love to hear in the comments below what you think about Intel versus Texas Instruments versus other people in this space. And another one will come up later as we discussed NVIDIA in this meetup as well. Next came up J&J, my number one favorite stock of all time. J&J, stock price is up. I kind of lost track of it because I was thinking, hey, it's gone up a bunch. What's so interesting, and I'm so glad it was brought up, is, man, just look at this. The, the EPS for 2019 will come in at an 867, 2020 uh, in the $9 range. This puts the PE in the 15s and 16s, people. This thing is still cheap. It's dirt cheap. It's not as cheap as Pfizer. It's not as cheap as AbbVie. It's dirt cheap. And so I'm kind of thinking, Ian, 2020, I'm going to learn all about these drug pipelines. And you know what? I'm putting money, no doubt, AbbVie, Pfizer. I'm probably going to put some money J&J. &J. And so I thank you guys. Payout ratio, 44%. I love these meetups because it just triggered this thought. Why did I keep forgetting about my number one stock? I need to look at it again. It's And I look at it. It looks to me to be a fabulous bargain. And they're, they're just such an unparalleled company. Anyways, moving on. We talked about McDonald's. This one's a bit expensive at a PE of almost 25. What I liked about McDonald's that I hadn't realized before is that compound annual growth rate on the dividend is 8%. So it's just a massive uh, streak of increasing dividends. Coca-Cola came up uh, high PE of 25. So I'll be staying away from Coca-Cola for a while. And that compound annual growth rate is not very high. 5.6, all right. Uh, we talked about Chipotle. What was interesting about Chipotle I kind of just discounted this thing because once they had the health scare, I'm like, you know what? I'm never eating there again. And I think since then, maybe I ate there once. Chipotle has come back. The stock has rebounded. And so they don't pay a dividend, but this is a company, kind of company that could pay a dividend in the future. Now, the problem with them is the PE is a 59. Does it deserve a PE of 59? And I start rationalizing in this market, should I buy Chipotle for a PE of 59? Or should I go and buy Johnson & Johnson for a PE of 16? Or Pfizer at a PE of 13? Or AbbVie at a PE in that 10 range? And so it's just interesting. And NVIDIA, the reason NVIDIA was brought up high PE of 41 is because someone in the entertainment industry was at our meetup. And he was sharing that they're starting to make these GPU farms of NVIDIA processors for their high intensity graphics work that they do in Hollywood. And so I thought this is why I love LA because you always run into folks who are in the entertainment industry. It's so interesting. And um, he was saying how NVIDIA is an interesting investment candidate potentially because of this presence in the entertainment industry. And so I know that NVIDIA is also very heavily used in um, cryptocurrencies and in Bitcoin farming as well. And so I thought that was really interesting. Anyways, these are the stocks we discussed. My biggest takeaway from all of this here is j and Got to put you back on my list. Intel, I probably will never buy you, but I sure want to learn more about it. I want to learn, are all these bad bad things being said all these years about Intel, are they true or not? And so I love these these meetups. I'm going to do more of them in 2020. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, get one more in 2019 before it's up, but probably 2020 at this point, probably January. Do a lot of these. And um, I love them because it gets all of us thinking about investing and thinking about new and different things. And so thank you for that, everyone. Okay, so moving along here, what I'm going to do now is I want to just start going through my notes. And so I went through kind of the big bullet points first. Now I want to go through some of my notes. And so this video, a lot to cover, but look, um, uh, break it into sessions if you got to. Um, I want to just get through all of it because there is so much value from this meetup. Okay, so... Um, we talked about some investing tools and websites. I'm just going to mention this very quickly. There's a website called Real Vision that one of the investors uses, and he uses this to get a lot of his um, information on the financial markets. I um, want to thank my friend Richard at the meetup for actually demoing the Fast Graphs software to me. I was really excited to see Fast Graphs. I'd heard a lot about it. I'm, I'm thinking at this point, I may go for it and get myself a fast graphs license and use that product because it would save me a lot of time with my analysis. We'll see. I really have a hard time spending money 
on recurring monthly payments for anything. Um, because I'm trying to be frugal. I'm trying to save every penny I can for my investments. But look, in certain cases, it's it's so worth it. And I was blown away with fast graphs. And one thing really interesting with fast graphs is they had the metric of debt to market cap debt to market capitalization in there. And I thought I was the only one that looked at it. I've uh, shared a lot of videos here on the past of it that where I use the debt to market cap metric. And some people are like, hey, that's good, but you should look at it other ways. And I just was happy, quite frankly, to see that a software platform oriented towards dividend investors actually looks at it the way I look at it. I thought that was really, really cool. And I was actually quite surprised because again, I thought I was the only one that looked at it that way, looked at debt as a function of market cap. Um, worth mentioning fast graphs data is one day delayed, but honestly, who cares? The, the purpose, uh, I just pointing it out in case anyone's interested, but for me, I don't care because I'm using this data for strategic analysis for, you know, I buy and hold forever for very strategic analysis. Okay. I'm jumping around, but I just want to go through. I want to go through it all. I know I'm jumping around. There was an idea that was brought up when your dividend portfolio gets to a certain size the tax consequence of the dividends, it becomes more and more real. It's big. It's always real, but I'm saying it becomes, wow, meaningful. One idea that was brought up in the meetup was, hey, why not just own one stock? It's like a high yielder that you don't really care about as much and use all the dividends from that stock to pay the taxes across all the others. I thought that was a nice idea. It's kind of how I look at my stock that I own called Universal, ticker UVV. Recently bought more. And so I just wanted to share that. I thought that was a good insight from the meetup. Okay, so some more stuff that we covered in the meetup. I'm just jumping around. We talked about generations. It seems like we talk about this a lot in meetups. What was interesting though, if you're interested in learning about the different generations and how they all kind of interact, there's an author, Neil Howe. He wrote a uh, book about what he calls the fourth turning. I've heard Neil speak. And um, it was just interesting that other investors are kind of looking at it that way as well. And if you want to learn more about the different generations so you could predict the future and what's going to happen with society and therefore spending habits and therefore investing um, places to invest money, generational analysis is a good place to start. So Neil Howe, the fourth turning, I thought that was really interesting. And we talked a bit about millennials and how there's... Um, uh, different spending habits with millennials, uh, different lifestyle habits, and with younger folks as well, younger generations than millennials. We talked a little bit about modern monetary theory, which is actually something that scares me a bit, but that seems to be gaining some steam, which could create um, a bigger supply of money, a much bigger supply of money than there already is. I start thinking about things like that, and uh, certainly I feel good about owning stocks because stocks are very good to own in a potentially inflationary environment, um, businesses versus owning the paper, the paper, um, paper money. So what else? We talked about a book called Hug Your Haters um, by Jay Bear. This was just, um, you know, all of us in life from time to time, we have our skeptics, we have our people who uh, may quote unquote hate on what we're doing. And so one of the team members was just saying, you may want to you may want to um, hug your haters. Your haters may be very good for you. They may be providing constructive feedback to help you improve this and that. I haven't read the book, but it was a book recommendation from the meeting. Now, check this out. I got to do this shout out. I got to do shout out here. Um, when I first started on YouTube long time ago, I um, wanted to do videos about dividends. And so I look up on YouTube, dividends, who's ranking? Canna Campbell from Sugar Mama TV. Fast forward all these years and she is still at the top of the game. Canna is now an author of two books. I own both of them. I actually have them right here. So here's her first book, The Thousand Dollar Project. Highly, highly recommend this book, fabulous book. And here's her new book, Mindful Money. And so this is the book that I'm reading now and that I'm going to keep as my companion in 2020. And so I'm jumping around a bit, but as long as we're talking about books and I've done videos recently about my 2020 goals, I'm just kind of talking about some 2020 stuff for a minute, which books I'm reading in 2020. So Canna, what's so interesting about the way she approaches life is she's a mom now to two kids and uh, 
She likes to live a minimalistic lifestyle. Uh, she also likes to have really good fashions and is really into saving money and investing for cash flow. And so a lot of what she kind of lives resonates with me a lot. And so I've uh, been a huge fan of her channel all of these years. And so just huge shout out. I'll link in the um, a link somewhere below um, in the uh, probably in one of my uh, comments below, my pinned comment below so that you can check out Sugar Mama TV as well and some of the other shout outs that I'm giving today as well. But thank you, Canna, for all you do. And so the uh, thing I want to say, though, is I started reading Mindful Money. Mindful Money is a very interesting book. If you do Mindful Money right, it's the kind of thing that you're taking notes. It actually has a bunch of checklists and notes in there. You're keeping it with you through the year and you're using it to improve your financial well-being. And the reason that this is one of my favorite books for 2020 and a book that I'll be keeping with me throughout the year is I want to continue to refine my savings and my budgeting. And that's what Canna really focuses on on her channel, Sugar Mama TV, is she's really, really gifted when it comes to saving money, when it comes to manifesting money, when it comes to having a good attitude towards money and um, generating the money. And quite frankly, half the battle with dividend investing, cash flow investing is just saving the money, just having the money. The other half, obviously, is picking the stocks or picking the strategy, which is mostly what I discuss on my channel here. And so something like this really complements my strategy uh, for me personally as I look to save more and more money and refine my um, my strategy, my budgeting strategy. And so that's one book I'm reading in 2020. Uh, two other books, by the way, these aren't even related to investing, but this one is called Inward. It's by an author named Young Pueblo. This is actually a book. I was watching some podcasts on YouTube and I heard um, uh, Young Pueblo uh, speak and I was really impressed. He is basically challenging all of us in so society. He thinks that basically and I'm probably not doing this full service, but he's basically says that looking inward, really understanding one's true motivations, really seeking true happiness in life and positivity, he believes that will that will solve many of society's problems, if not most of them. And so this is a book. What I like about this book is it's kind of full of short poems. And so what I plan to do actually is read one of them each day and then really meditate and think about the poem. I believe that's how a lot of people are using this book inward successfully. I also follow Young Pueblo on social media, so I really enjoy what he publishes. But what I was even thinking is when I wake up in the morning, I'm trying to have a much more positive routine in the morning because sometimes I'm quite frankly very grumpy in the morning. I don't get enough sleep. And so I'm trying to really uh, flip that. And one of the ideas that I had was just read a page out of Young Pueblo's Inward each morning with my son, and we could just think about what he's saying and how it relates to our lives. And so that's another book. I'll tell you, for me, 2020, the types of stuff I'm reading, books, it's got to be stuff that it's not just a quick read, but it kind of carries me through the whole year. And so the third book um, that I'm reading in 2020 is this one called uh, Zero Limits. This is a book by Joe Vitale. He's another author that I've heard um, speak on podcasts. And what's interesting about this man is he used to be homeless and he has manifested this dream life uh, through through various actions that he's taken and ways that basically through the way he thinks and approaches. He's also really big into hard work. He's a very hardworking man. But um, I kind of like his story. And so I got more interested in what he's all about. And you guys also know I got mad love for the Hawaiian Islands. And so this book called Zero Limits, Joe really goes into this concept of Ho'opono Pono. And I hope I'm, I'm uh, saying that, pronouncing that correctly. But it is a Hawaiian philosophy, basically, that allows one to manifest right in front of them the dream lifestyle that they want, the dream life that they want. It's again, goes into that whole notion of positivity. And um, so hearing him speak, liking his story, loving the Hawaiians out there. Shout out if you live in Hawaii. I love you all. I uh, thought I'd uh, go for Zero Limits as my third book this year. And so, no, I'm jumping around a bit, but I thought I'd just share that with you as long as we're on the topic of books. All right. So moving along, we discussed in the meetup 
uh, some real estate investing. And so we had a member of the community who is a real estate investor. He owns some properties out of state, out of California, and he manages them remotely. And um, these are these are residential properties. And one of the, the things that came out of this is I think all of us agreed in the meetup that basically real estate investing, because I work in real estate as a professional, I'm a developer and investor, commercial, big commercial properties. It is hands on. It is hard work. It's not passive. It's active, active, <laughs> very active, at least in the early days. Passive maybe in the long run, but there's a lot of sweat equity that goes into it, much more than dividend investing. And so that was one thing off the bat that we all talked about. But one thing I want to share, if you're out there, you're into real estate investing, um, I want to um, share something with you. This um, subscriber, this community member brought something to the table called Buildium. This is a app or a software that allows you to have your tenants manage their um uh, their relationship with you online. So if you're a landlord and you want to collect payments online, Buildium allows you to do that. And so I thought that was really cool. I was really happy that he shared that uh, with the community. I think that would benefit a lot of people in this community. We talked about brokers for a minute. I don't want to name names because I don't want to put any broker down, but we had one member of the community that was saying, hey, I needed to basically get my money. I needed my money now. And I had one of these apps one of these newer brokers, and there was a $10,000 per day limit on extracting money out of the account. So just as you're thinking about your brokerage strategy, if you're ever in that situation where you need money fast, look into the terms and conditions of the brokers you're with, and it may help you choose one broker or over another. I thought that was just a nightmare story. If I want my money out of my broker, I want them to honor that the same day. I want them to wire it out. The fact that this investor faced a $10,000 per day limit was just shocking to me. And so just a word of caution to the community, look at your broker and look at their policy. I wanted to share that with all of you. And um, I just want to give a few shout outs now before I leave. Shout out to my man, Jason. Um, I'm going to link to his YouTube channel in the pinned comment as well. It's called Investing with Jason. I got to meet Jason at this meetup. He's local from the greater LA area. He has a new YouTube channel. He had a world of knowledge to share with us all at the meetup. So thank you, Jason. Shout out. I want to give a shout out to uh, Cherry Tongue. She has a channel here on YouTube called Finance and Fashion. And so it's a really cool YouTube channel. Check it out. Um, I wish, Cherry, you could have stayed at the meetup even longer, but she mentioned she left a little early because she had yet another meetup to go to in the real estate space. Um, so that is really cool. Um, and um, you got to love uh, fashion as well, pairing that with finance. That's awesome. And so shout out. And then I want to give a shout out last to my man, Richard the Magician. So he has a YouTube channel as well. And Richard is a member of our community, dividend investor. He um, He's the one actually that asked that really uh, fabulous question at the beginning. I hope everyone enjoyed my response. And um, he actually did a magic trick for us at the meetup at the end that left us all astounded. I'm telling you, like jaw dropping, like what just happened? He is like the best magician I have ever seen. And so Richard, you are awesome. Thank you. I can't wait uh, for the next meetup in Los Angeles, all of you. And so quite frankly, yeah, and I'll link to these in the pinned comment below. Share the love, check out these members of the community. Shout out to all, everyone who came. Jason, uh, Tanja, Faraz, Drew, Richard, Tanner, Cherry, Andy, Thank you. Thank you, all of you who enjoyed the meetup, who participated in the meetup, took the time to enjoy three hours of Starbucks coffee with me talking about dividend stocks. I love you all. Before I leave today, in terms of a full disclosure, I own the stocks mentioned today. I am long universal, ticker symbol UVV. I am long Starbucks, ticker symbol SBUX. ABV, ticker symbol ABBV. Pfizer, ticker symbol PFE, Cedar Fair, ticker symbol FUN, uh, Johnson & Johnson, ticker symbol JNJ, McDonald's, ticker symbol MCD, Coca-Cola, ticker symbol KO. And I actually think that's all of them. I am long all of those stocks in my personal 
dividend stock portfolio. Before I leave today, in terms of a friendly disclaimer, today's video is not investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment advisor. Today's video is just for your fun and entertainment. If you're going to go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, make any financial decisions, please consult a licensed financial advisor first. I'm just sharing my journey here on YouTube, and I have, as always, additional disclaimers, disclosures in the description below. Please take that seriously. Uh, information here is just uh, provided as is, and I'm doing doing my best to share just my own journey for fun and entertainment. Hey, everyone. Just wanted to wish you a happy holiday season. Thank you for your support. Thank you to all the Thug Life investors who are supporting PBC Ian through purchasing my merch. I will link to that in the description as well. I love you all. I um, wish you all a really happy new year as well, although we'll be seeing each other on another video before then for sure. I will see you all in the next dividend investing video.